let us discuss some of the aspects of economic transition of the states of Central Eastern Europe <coughs> after 1989. So, uh, in order to, to, again, get the picture, we need to remember that in 1989, uh, with the revolutions, the, <coughs> the expectations were, were uh, huge, right? They, they were significant. And the expectations were uh, manifold. Right? The idea was that we removed the communist regime, which insulated artificially these these, uh, these countries from, from Europe where they felt they, they belonged, and they belonged historically and culturally. <coughs> and uh, once you remove that, then you will have both democracy and uh, prosperity and return to this cultural whatever sphere, um, social whatever uh, sphere, right? And <coughs> they were familiar with the state of affairs in Western Europe and you know, stable, pro prosperous and so on. That's exactly what we want to do and what we should do, except for these, these communist regimes, right? which we just removed, right? But as the book makes it clear, and this is what are very important in terms of transitions, and just now in the news we have the news of, uh, you know, about Burma and the elections there and how Song Ki, uh, right? Um, uh, uh, nobody missed her answer name, uh, who, uh, who, whose, whose party won the elections, and it, this has been part of a transition there from an uh, authoritarian regime to a democratic regime that has been going on for a few years, but now is the first election where her party, I think, won the entire, you know, the opposition won the election, so to speak. You see, you see the parallels, and again, the expectations are large, are, are significant, are huge, uh, to use a colloquialism. Uh, but now you know that these, this is not as simple. So now, now when you read these articles, you will start to be, uh, you know, and be able to understand and kind of be uh, prudent in terms of what the transition actually entails, right? And if any of you will be involved in the future in, in policy making, let's say in foreign affairs, then the, here's, here's the thing, right? You, now you know that uh, we can't just expect that, okay, we're re 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 remove an authoritarian regime and then everything will fall into place, right? Things are much more complicated. And your, books, uh, your book does a good deal of dealing with, especially the political and economic transition, the social part is you know, perhaps not as thorough, but it makes some points. Um, uh, but um, some good points, right? So you need to <laughs> read it, of course. Uh, the point here is that um, to understand the, 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 the gigantic expectations, but also then to understand that these are different things. They are related. They are very close. They are closely related, right? As we will see, uh, the political transition, the move to a multi-party system, liberal democracy, all those criteria, the four criteria of liberal democracy that we have discussed, right? Uh, right, just think of the fact that rule of law, as you mentioned, is one of the criteria of liberal democracy. Well, without rule of law, there is no functioning economy. Right? Part of the problem in Russia after the fall of the USSR, when they endeavored the same sort of transitions, which failed in Russia, and the reason for failing in Russia and the Russian Federation is that today there is Putin, and there is an authoritarian regime today, really, which used to be illiberal, right? but now is authoritarian. Right? It, never, it was a liberal democracy perhaps in the 90s, but then illiberal, now authoritarian, because this transition failed. So you see, the, the stakes are very high. The stakes are very high and it's not, a, it's not a simple thing and it's not unidirectional and it's not a given. So the fact that all of the countries in Central East Europe are democratic uh, and they have functioning market economies with various you know, problems, but all of them today, in, and in various degrees, that is a, a tremendous thing. And it, it's worth asking why here, why not elsewhere, right? Why not in Russia? Right? And that, those are different explanations. But the point is that now, you know, it, it is worth to look at the, at the economic transition uh, because it is different from the political transition, although they're related. Okay, so let's think about the economic transition. From what to what, right? We talk about transition, the question is from what to what, right? So what was the situation during communism, right? There was no market, literally no market because the factories were uh, subsidized by the... everything was owned by everyone, meaning the state. <laughs> meaning that an elite of the party, actually, as always, you know, someone needs to be there, right? Which is the leading force, right? The leading revolutionary force. Uh, they actually controlled, uh, just like they controlled uh, political life, they also controlled the economy. Because uh, communist regimes are party states. The party is the, uh, owns the, uh, controls the state, the state is run by the party. That's, uh, these, these two intertwine. That's the situation, for example, today in China. Um, so it's a party state in which an elite 
you have the reins of power, uh, political power, but also economic, obviously, because it's all owned by the state, and also social, because they manipulate life, right? Uh, there's no space of free speech and so on. Because um, they, the, they know the path, right? Um, actually, it's because of their interest. So, what was going on was that um, there was no market because uh, all the factories were owned by the state, in fact, right? It was state-owned, but um, and um, they produced. Um, they didn't produce to to. Um, let me put it this way: their market was guaranteed. They produced for other factories in the country mostly, um, and those produced for these and this this uh, these relationships, right? Which which in the normal in the market, right? In an actual market, are guided by the value of the of the. Things produced and the costs and and how much you you know you bet, uh, uh, the profit right so you know you have to produce good things at good price in order to be to sell them right and then you have to find buyers and so on so all of this is the mechanism of the market whether we like it or not right it didn't exist right because the market was guaranteed which meant that that actually the the, the quality of the products were low and uh, it was a it was a vicious cycle and. Uh, this was combined with the fact that there was no, there were some risks, but there was no significant risk because part of the whole policy was that everybody would be has to be employed. That was part of the communist policy. Well, that mean, meant you know um, again it meant a lack of efficiency. You kept these huge factories. Remember, I mentioned when I mentioned about the Timisoara revolution and all those workers coming into downtown to protest, taking over the city, uh, tens, uh, thousands and thousands. It, they could do that because the factories they're employed, you know, some of the larger factories, tens of thousands of people. I mean, staggering numbers, right? They were employed because everybody needed to be employed. So the, the factories were supported by the state, so even if they were working in deficit or not profiting, it didn't, didn't matter, they were subsidized by the state. Right? And all of this was part of a big economic program or plan run by the state, planned by the state on false numbers. Because the reporting was always needed to show, remember, that you know we're doing better, we're doing better, we're doing better. We had the five-year plans, five years we need to do. And mostly this better meant not actual better product, it meant quantity. Right? We produce more steel, more of this. Well, is it good steel? Does anybody buy it? Nobody. That's a whole different thing. It was more of a... And remember the emphasis on heavy industry and so on. So it's a, it's a centrally planned, elite-driven, you know, communist elite, uh, benefiting, you know, system in which, based on which the real inefficiency, uh, uh, implicitly, corruption is in the system because again there is no accountability. That the, the, the party that leads everything, right? And you get up in the party by being a good party man, right? By saying the right stuff and criticizing and you know towing the party line. It's, it's not based on efficiency here, right? It's it's based on party climbing the party man, climbing the, the social and economic ranks. This was parallel, right? But climbing the party has nothing to do with, to do with competence. The party ranks, right? Um, so, uh, this is, was also real with corruption because all these dysfunctionalities that your book also details, uh, so, you know, this is again complementary, um, led to a, a lack of consumer goods, right? And, and that led to the uh, black market. So, the grey market or black market, right? Uh, was flourishing, and um, it was, and everybody was part of it, basically, because everything that you needed you had to obtain through, either on the black market, grey market, or through, uh, you know, through uh, connections, right? which meant that even the normal system was, um, uh, everybody was, was riddled with, 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 with corruption. For example, you want to get something from a store, well, some of the goods were in the back and you had to know the, uh, the, the vendor, basically, the, the salesperson there at the, the, the counter, right, and, or give them something. And, and the same went in every single aspect, right? The medical system, the same thing, you know, like paying for... It, in principle, it was free, right? Because it was state-owned, everybody was employed by the state, but actually, it was the great market in which everybody tried to survive, and it was there was uh, all this interchange, uh, and people learned to survive. The point is survive and providing for your family. That's, that's what everybody wanted, right? And this is an interesting point that um, even today in uh, <coughs> in China, 
you know, uh, the shocking part there is that nobody believes the story, right, the stuff, the, the propaganda, but everybody's out to make a buck. Everybody's out. It's actually a country that is highly individualistic nowadays, you know, because everybody's just about, you know, making the money, you know. Uh, it's a very interesting thing. It's a very interesting uh, situation. But that, you know, uh, it's like, you know, this forced communitarianism, it's not communitarian, it's like forced communism, right, creates huge individualism, actually, because everybody is, it needs to survive and provide for their family and so on. So anyway, uh, it's an inefficient system with good corruption in which the elite party leaders, you know, which, because they would remember the nomenclatura, right, the nomenclatura, the top uh, leadership of the party, uh, had access to goods, even consumer goods, uh, either also consumer goods that are not available to the regular population and so on. They were in bed in a way with, uh, with the grey market and so on, there were these networks. So that's uh, and, and the positions uh, in the party and in the, in the economy and in the state also uh, came with benefits, concrete benefits. So this is a case of so-called patrimonialism, patrimonialism, which is um, uh, the expression patrimonialism of treating um, positions, the political uh, positions in the state or in the political system as a, as a personal. Um, Fiefdom, right? As, as a personal uh, property, right? So I, I find the, the you know, the county uh, council uh, president, which is actually party secretary, then I treat that as my as my fiefdom, right? I, I sell position. I'm I'm benefiting. This is like a source of um, uh, enrichment for me, right? This is not foreign for you know political systems. The, even democratic political systems, think of the party machines in, in Chicago, Boston, New York, uh, uh, you know, up to not even so long ago, right, in which, you know, uh, positions in the administration were given for political support and benefits and so on. So, you know, this is not absurd. Uh, but it, it was even more so there because there was no competition, there was no accountability, there wasn't even the chance of accountability because there are no elections and so on. So that's the system. And from this to move to uh, a working market economy. Now, right immediately you see the problems. First of all, there is no market. Create, create a market. Then populate it with actors. Which, where from? Right? There, you know, businesses are not just created overnight. Like, okay, let's have a business. Capital, where from capital? Skills, like you know, and at least in the countries of Central Eastern Europe, which had a history of uh, you know civic culture, um, at least those more so those in the Central Europe. And also, in many of them, they, there have been some openings towards market. Remember Hungary, Yugoslavia, right? Even Poland, you could you could start some small smaller businesses, two three employees, since the 70s, 80s. So you've had these moves, right? So there were some accumulated skills and, and beginnings and so on. But you know, you have to reinvent. This. Think of the legal framework that needs to be established, right? That needs to be working. Think of establishing new institutions that would make this this function. Right, uh, you know, the taxation institutions, file supervisory institutions, right, change the entire banking system. And I'm doing an overview of, of things and you know, complete it with, with what you see in the textbook. But I'm emphasizing certain issues here. Um, so, you know, you can't rely just on the video lecture, as you can't rely only on the textbook either. Um, <coughs> so, uh, Populate it with, with functioning, all the functioning elements of a market. Again, from banking system to supervisory institutions to the law, legal framework, to very important that was lacking in, 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 the, in Russia after the fall of USSR, which is why it failed this transition, because they implemented these laws for, for, for uh, you know, free market, completely free market, but it was a complete failure because what was lacking, right? and this, remember, this is a key issue condition to have a liberal democracy is the rule of law, right? Meaning, which means what? It means that the body of law that actually applies to everyone and is actually enforced, enforced through the uh, uh, institutions of law enforcement, but also through the judicial system. And working courts, the, the judicial system reform is a huge, huge deal. Because remember, who populated the, the courts? The courts were actually the, an arm of the communist regime to implement its ideology, not a justice uh, a system of judicial justice you know, oriented institutions, right? So you need to reshape, and you can't just, you know, uh, you can't invent new judges, you can't invent new lawyers, right? And even if new generations come, they will be taught by 
the old generation. I mean, this is a very gradual process. You can't just say, okay, from now on you will act differently. You know, uh, your chapter on social transition actually makes some good points in terms of the importance of cultural transition um, uh, and how this, this differs in different areas. And this takes us to our discussion of the three different regions that went with different speeds. But you see, rule of law has to do with, uh, with, with politics. Right? Has to do with politics and the functioning of the entire political system, uh, and that is one of the hardest things to do, you know, um, to, to implement and create. And here is where actually one of the major differences still between the three areas that we have discussed, right? Uh, Poland, Czech, Hungary, let's add Slovakia, Slovenia, right? Um, Central Europe, basically, right? Versus Eastern Europe, which would be Romania, Bulgaria, versus the Balkans, which is the countries of former Yugoslavia, ex excluding Croatia and Slovenia, right? Uh, these three areas, right, still, still, are still manifest significant differences, and especially in this area of the rule of law, right? Today, as the book tell, uh, you know mentions, uh, so you should know, uh, uh, you know, all these uh, countries that I mentioned, the first and the second group, are part of the European Union. The European Union is a space. Is a, is a set of institutions, is a political construct within which there are there's free market, uh, but there's also some conditions regarding politics, regarding democratic politics, but also regarding the rule of law and functioning of law, right? So you have Poland, Czech, Slovakia, Hungary, Slovenia, Croatia, Romania, Bulgaria, all of these are part of the European Union, right? And they, you know, um, benefit from many things, but also need to present certain conditions, right? Uh, in order to join and so on. The latest one to join was Croatia. This is why everybody wants to be part of the European Union, because it's a space of democracy and prosperity. The, the dream, right? The dream. Um, however, Romania and Bulgaria still are struggling with these judicial reforms, even today, with eliminating corruption and so on. That's 25 years later. And functioning, you know, independence of the judiciary, because, you know, politics is so powerful and so on. Even more so, uh, so and they, they are in the European Union, okay? Even more so the countries of the Balkans, the Western Balkans, right, from Bosnia to Serbia to Macedonia to whatever, right. So, um, here's, a, here's a major difference still. But without rule of law, how do you have a functioning market, for example? Because how, can, how are contracts enforced? How, are, uh, how do you make sure that the, the framework, the legal framework for a free, for a free market uh, actually works, right? And so you need to create a market, create a functioning market economy, uh, which means creating the framework, the institutions, uh, both supervisory and judicial, uh, that function, that work, um, and, and, but, and also populate it with, with actors. Now, populating with actors is a huge thing, right? Because, again, all of the, all of the property, the industrial economic, is, belongs to everyone in common, it's basically, it's owned by the state, basically it's run by the party, right, party elites. Now, how do you transfer that, right? Because all of the property is there, including agriculture, remember, for in many of these countries, cooperatives, right, which are, again, owned by the state. So how do you transfer it back into private hands? That's a huge thing. The wealth of the state, right, of the country, is administered all by the state. Now, how do you get to give it back to the people? In what sense? In what way? Because, you know, it's not only like, okay, just take it, but you also, these are investments in the country, in the country's future. This is the economy. You can't just, okay, take it away. You have to make sure that it also will function. So here's this huge factory producing, I don't know, trains and, uh, you know, uh, basically, uh, you know, actual examples. And how do you privatize this? Because that's the idea, privatization. Meaning the transfer of property from, uh, and of economic assets from the means of production, <laughs> the means of production from the state to the, private uh, ownership. Which private ownership? So here, privatization was, was a major a major issue. Because uh, how do you do this, right? Um, and there were several uh, methods uh, and, uh, that uh, your book also mentions, right? Uh, so let's, let's just, and I'm going to focus on two or three of them. Uh, there was the manager-employee buyout, the MEBO, um, uh, there was the voucher schemes, the IPO, uh, in initial public offerings, direct sale to someone, or public tenders, okay? So I'm going to focus here on, on the voucher, uh, direct sale, and public tender, basically. So there were two, two major strategies, I put it this way, right? One is 
selling this to investors, right? Well, let's say three. Put it in parentheses what I just said, and let's just let me more mention first something more specific, which is restitution. So one of the things that was applied or tried in different ways in some of these countries, because remember, there is no blueprint. No country has done what these countries have done in those five, six, ten years. No country in the world. Though for the West, it took them 200 years to build a functioning market economy with huge turmoil and revolutions and so on, remember, right? So they are expected to do all this transition in five, six, and they want to do it five, six, ten years. So with that in mind. Okay, so the one of the first thing was restitution, because remember all this, a lot of this property, right, that was now in the hands of the state, including especially agricultural and real estate, houses and so on, have been confiscated, nationalized is the word, right, which is confiscation and putting, putting it in the hands of the state, when communism was imposed, right? So you lost everything you had because the state took it, right, that was everyone's, meaning the states. Uh, <coughs> so part of the justice of the transition of, of the of the, uh, the the sort of the, the demand of justice was to restitution, and that especially applied to agricultural uh, estates. So you know, my family had its land, its plot, its whatever. I you know, we need to get it back, right? Because they it was taken in forty nine by the by the by the regime, right? So that was part of it. Also, real estates were restituted, but again, in different countries, it's worked. This was done differently, and some did it more, some did it very little. You know, Hungary didn't do much of this, right? So restitution was one. But you see, here's the problem with restitution. Restitution is justice, right? You give back what was stolen, what was taken by force. But is it efficient economically, right? Does it mean that those people, that these are descendants, your know, grandsons and so on, do they have the means, the capital to do something with that? Or will this, all this agricultural land go to waste? And that also happened in many, in many places. So, you know, things, justice, profit, you know, but, you know, you have to do both, right? Then, so restitution was one thing. But that was one aspect, it mostly applied to agriculture and real estate. Then, back to the two methods, or two major types of methods. One is the voucher system, and the other one is selling, uh, you know, this uh, state property to investors. Right? So let's focus on this, you know, selling, transferring to private hands. Um, then they mentioned direct sales and public tenders, right? I'm just going to treat them together, right? You should know all those five ways. Because I'm going to, I want to point certain major issues. Who do you sell this to? Right? One, who has money? Who has money <laughs> coming out of communism, right? First of all, people did not have money because accumulating capital is capitalism, so you don't have money in communism. Actually, having a lot of money is a problem, and you might be thrown into jail and so on. Um, illicit, it was called illicit. Okay. Um, then, uh, if you had money in communism, then it meant two things. You either were part of the grey, well, you might have put some money aside, but that's not money to buy a factory. Okay, let's be very clear here. Then, um, okay, then you, you maybe you were part of the grey economy, or black economy, you, you're a black marketeer who's been selling goods, uh, manipulating whatever, in, in part of that network, and then yes, you accumulated money. Yes. Or you were part of the party elites who had access to benefits, who did were part connected to this black grey market, then you had money. So there's the thing, people who have money are not necessarily the, the best actors you want to have uh, money. Or sons of these people, by the way. Uh, so these are, you know, so who do you sell internally? Then, okay, not internally, let's say, let's sell to foreign investors, foreign direct investment, FDI. Well, that's another problem, right? What do you mean? Sell everything that the state, i.e. quote-unquote, the nation has to foreigners, you're selling out, right? And that is, goes against, you know, patriotism or nationalism, right? In many of these countries, nationalism is a big force, uh, not patriotism, nationalism. We're going to talk about the difference between those. Uh, so, <laughs> so, again, you're in a conundrum. Again, you're in a conundrum because you can't just sell everything to foreign. So, or you might want to do so, but you see, it's a, it's a big thing. So here's... The third, this is, here's why the other method of the voucher method was also used, which is, let's divide, let's give all the uh, citizens uh, coupons or vouchers, right, with which they can buy uh, actions, they can buy stock in these privatizing uh, in, uh, institutions, or formerly state-owned institutions. So here's this factory, okay, here are, there are many factories, right, uh, and you as a citizen get for free basically a voucher by which basically they, once, 
it's the reverse of nationalization. <laughs> nationalization is putting all property in the hands of the state, and this is basically giving it back to everyone. Right? Equally. Well, it sounds nice and democratic, but you get what? Two, three, whatever vouchers, ten vouchers. You get two, three uh, shares, right? Uh, ten, right? That's nothing. Right? When you have tens of thousands or uh, hundreds of thousands of shares in a factory or whatever it is. Right? So, uh, it doesn't result in, it just results in a, in a, in a uh, fracturing right, uh, of, of ownership into many, many small, tiny hands that don't have, you know, any say. Okay? So, who will govern these things? Like, there's no, you know, uh, these are not big investors who could have a say. So, so it was it was inefficient. So many people, you know, just made a quick buck by selling these vouchers to people who were really willing to buy them immediately. Okay, you sell my voucher, and these were again a sort of a, you know, side investors. You know, I give these these vouchers to the entire population, but there will be a few actors who will buy them from the rest <laughs> because they they had not just the money but the know-how. And for most of the people, this thing didn't bring you any profit, basically. Okay, so here's a, someone who wants to buy. Yeah. Uh, so this this was and here's the here's the interesting thing here's the interesting thing that you, your book mentions we talk about the three areas right and notice that the voucher system uh, well you know it was used in several several places but not just the voucher system this whole you know the process of moving property from the state to private hands um, uh, the the establishment of a functioning legal system and the legal framework for market. The speed of privatization, the speed of, of setting these things up, the political will behind it, right? uh, and the quality of the transition in many ways, right, differed in, among these three uh, regions. So all these aspects of economic transition that the, your book mentions, and I, I pointed a few out, right, uh, they will manifest themselves differently in the three regions. And notice there's some overlaps here, that in the Romania Bulgaria where the first, uh, where the first uh, election were won by ex-communists, basically, reform, not so reformed, communists, right, second national or whatever, uh, and it would take six, seven years for the actual opposition to remove them, while in the countries of Central Europe that I mentioned, uh, the first action was the remo complete removal of former communists with the opposition. Well, in Central Europe, the reform went very fast. And you saw in Poland the shock therapy of Leszek, ba Leszek uh, Balcerowicz. And then in Czech Republic, uh, again, the shock therapy. Again, quick privatization. In Hungary, very quick spread. Hungary actually sold, privatized to foreign direct investment. The foreign direct investment was the largest in Hungary, which is a relatively small country compared to you know, Poland. In the 90s, Hungary was the most you know, privatized and the most foreign direct investment and so on. They were very quick to do that. Right? But you see, that there was the political will behind it. You see how all of this connects, right? Plus, they were better situated also in terms of geography. They were closer to the West. There was a transition of tradition of manufacturing in the Czech Republic, and all these things that we have, that your book talks about, that we have mentioned, right? So all these things contribute to the fact that their economic transition will be much faster, while Romania and Bulgaria will lag like significantly behind, also because there was no political will. There was no. Well, why wasn't there political will? Why was there such a slow political transition? You see how these intertwine. Also, who were these? These were ex-communists who wanted a very gradual political transition, or didn't really want, uh, and um, any or you know whatever third way ideas they had, um, uh, and also were very careful to maintain all that network of of social benefits of social. Uh, uh, you know, of, of state involvement in supporting the social and economic life of the country. Now, they, they maintain it. So, uh, another aspect of this transition, right, uh, was also the fact that the state was heavily invested in, the, uh, in, in maintaining, supporting these economic actors through subsidies, but also subsidizing, you know, uh, people through giving everyone jobs, and also subsidizing people through everybody has a guaranteed pension and so on. And all of this sounds nice and well, you know, uh, but once it's, there's a market economy, the state, first of all, all those factories don't provide these things anymore, but provide pensions or whatever. The state takes it up, but it has less resources because the economy is actually unperforming. You're just, you know, you're in the process of privatizing. So the state is burdened with a lot of social costs and, and, uh, and uh, it, 
it doesn't have the resources to provide them. And also in these countries, Romania and Bulgaria, the, because of these were ex-communists, they also were keen on keeping these subsidies, both to the factories and to the, to the people. You know, they were re reluctant to cut these abruptly, okay, uh, because that was painful. And this is the difference between the so-called shock therapy and the more gradual approach. And you see, you see here that the shock therapy mostly happened here in these countries of Central Europe, Czech, Poland, uh, uh, Hungary, not so much in the 90s, but later. Uh, and, and Romania and Bulgaria, uh, they took the gradual approach. And while the shock therapy was very painful and it went with huge political costs, this is why the opposition lost the elections immediately after uh, the second election, right? In all these countries, right? First of all, they didn't deliver, and then they also implemented some painful reforms, okay? But now, but then, all of these fared better than the so-called gradual approach, because gradual approach meant the continuation of, of, all, that, uh, of all those in inefficiencies, corruption, stagnation of the system. You know, gradual approach means you don't reform the rule, the legal system, the framework, the institutions, uh, the, the market. So you're not going anywhere. You're trying to kind of, well, gradual. What does it mean gradual? And gradual also meant that there were so many opposite, uh, 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 opportunities for, for, uh, for corruption. Especially since this was a system that itself didn't change, right? These were the ex communists they didn't reform the administration, they didn't reform quickly the, 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 the legal system and so on. I mean, the problems that they would encounter will, will be seen also in the Central Europe, but to a to much higher degree in Romania and Bulgaria. Cor corruption, for example. Okay, we are privatizing this big factory, okay? First of all, which factory? Who decides? It's the state, right? The, higher levels of the administration of the state, of the government. Well, who occupies those, those positions? The same people who occupied them before, or people appointed by political, on political criteria now by the, these, the, the, you know, the reform or ex right? Uh, so these are people either part of the old system or appointed politically. I'm not saying that all of them were in intention, but there was huge occasion for graft, because it was lack of, tra it was, it lacked transfer, transparency. Right. In Central Europe, you have, if you have a massive privatization, uh, as in Hungary, right, uh, for massive foreign direct investment, it needs to be a very transparent process for it to, to happen such, or at least more transparent, to happen at large scale. When it happens piecemeal, then the question becomes, well, who, when, how, right, and who gets to decide? And those who get to decide get to also cut the slice for themselves, of course, right? Um, and and the, the regimes in Romania and Bulgaria also rely on this sort of administration relied on letting them get the benefits, you know. Famously, the Romanian president, Ion Iliescu, that, that ex-communist, you know, the second, third national communist, you know, he, he had this reputation of being poor but honest, okay? Yes, but his critics said, everybody around you is corrupt, so I don't care if you're poor and honest, if everybody is corrupt, and you're allowing them to continue, because you rely on them, right? Probably good. Um, so, um, uh, this gradual transition, uh, uh, you know, came with a lot of opportunities for a, a lack of transparency of, and for graft. Uh, so, as I was saying, you know, let's sell a factory, who decides which factory, right? The process can be a direct uh, uh, sale to, to an investor, but can also be a public tender. But public tenders are such an interesting thing, um, because public tenders, um, you know, I put out an announcement, okay, the fa this factory that produces trains are going to be sold. It's going to be sold. But, you know, uh, um, it's a competition for basically projects, not just, it's not a simple sale. Because this factory employs 20,000 people, okay? Now, if I just sell it to, a, to, a, to an investor blindfold with no conditions, no strings attached, uh, right? What happened very often is that these investors were not, actually not investors. They bought very valuable real estate. Right? They bought the factory, which was downtown, some, some important city. Right? Fired everyone the next day, literally. Well, next day, next month, but literally. Closed the whole thing down, sold everything, and then used the land to make huge amounts of money because downtown property is the most expensive. So here's the thing, right? there's no guarantee that this, this is not going to happen, so you're actually uh, deconstructing the economy. Right? You're taking the most important pieces and you're letting it fall apart because this enriched the person, but not didn't create, 
you know, industry, economy. So that doesn't work, let's say. Okay, so let's do public tenders in which there's a project competition in which the investor comes and he needs to guarantee that, okay, I'm going to maintain this open. I'm going to re, um, uh, retool the, the factory. I'm going to... So there's a plan that he needs to pr pr produce. But who judges the plan? Right? It's the same people who are perhaps interested to give this, to judge positively uh, one project over the other. Right? Because the criteria here is not how much money you get. That's the point. It's not just, okay, how much will he pay for our factory? In fact, some factories were sold for one dollar or whatever nominal thing because it wasn't about selling, making a profit, it was about making sure that this factory will be made competitive and then capped and will offer jobs and so on. See, it's a more complex thing, but judging it, right? Judging this needs to be an accountable, transparent process. Well, it is accountable, transparent, where you have accountability and transparency to a larger degree, like in the countries of Central Europe, and to a lesser, if it's lesser degree here, if it's less democratic, if it's quasi-illiberal as Romania and Bulgaria were in the early 90s, then you won't have this accountability and more possibility of graft. So you see how these things connect. Well, I didn't mention anything about the countries of former Yugoslavia because you understand what is going on there, right, in the early 90s, right? It's war. So in this case, privatization and such things, this is... You know, that's not an issue. It's nationalism, right? Everybody, everything is, remember, you know, U.S. in the World War II, the state, right, uh, requisitioned, you know, transformed factories, like the whole industry was put in the service of the, of the war effort, right? So that's what actual mobil, mobilization of the economy in the service of the war effort, right? So, you know, you can't have this, you know, this, this, this whole question is not even going to work, don't even function. But they will... Uh, Immediately after they, or after they uh, transition, they dissolve the state and nation building question, which is the first question, and they transition to functioning political systems. And the first, of course, was Slovenia, which immediately actually, right, it didn't really have a war, so fortunately, was closest to the West, always having part of the Austrian German sphere, as we remember, right, uh, most advanced uh, republic within the Yugoslavia. So, all of that, so Slovenia will have a tremendously fast transition. And in fact, as I told you, economically, it will be at the level of Austria before all the other countries of Central Eastern Europe. It also helps that it's a very small country, 2 million people. Beautiful, by the way, but uh, 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 tremendous. But, uh, you know, <laughs> situated between Italy and, and Germany and Austria. I mean, everything is there, okay? So they had a very fast thing. But then Croatia, right? But uh, the other countries will have to do the nation building, state building, and then the political transition to even get to ask themselves these, these questions. Serbia, right, will only remove Slobodan Milosevic in 2000. So the political transition is delayed 10 years, only then you can endeavor the, uh, the economic uh, transition. And then we haven't even talked about social costs, right? And, and your chapters list several of those things, uh, right? And just the first one that you, you mean, I mean, two things that immediately should pop into your mind is one, unemployment, and two, loss of uh, state support and all of these you know happen at the same time so you know the most the most hit by both of these things will be obviously those categories in the population that will be uh, most vulnerable by reason of age or of um, uh, professional standing right um, huge factories employed huge numbers tens of thousands of what blue collar workers that these are inefficient factories you bring in efficiency you bring in machines you have you have huge layoffs, huge layoffs because you don't need those uh, those uh, all that workforce. So retooling these people, then okay, the younger people might learn new skills, but how about those who in their fifties, sixties, uh, who's going to hire them? Right, that was one of the big things in the nineties. Who's who's hiring people in their fifties and sixties? Nobody. Everybody wants wants young people, right? Because they can learn it, whatever, right? Or even forties. Who's going to hire a, a blue-collar hand, handyman, you know, whatever, who used to work with his hands in this new factory when you have like 20 people in their 20s lining up for the job, right? So major, so those most affected were the older people uh, and blue-collar workers, less educated, right? And especially the rural area, which was most hardest hit because agriculture uh, uh, suffered a significant dump throughout the area. So, um, and this was coupled with the fact that the, the state needed to, right, uh, to, to, to take, to cut subsidies, 
subsidies because he didn't have the funds, because he needed to, to, to be made more flexible. How do you do that? Uh, and your book talks about various ways, you know, cut subsidies in one swoop, and that was part of the shock therapy, right? Uh, which you should know what it entailed, right? Shock therapy versus gradual transition. Uh, taking cutting in one swoop, right, that was Poland, right? Or, or, or uh, this uh, shock therapy, right? Um, and that came with huge costs, right? But it was sort of a surgery that was needed. It was felt, and the results actually were much better there than where they didn't cut in one swoop. Um, in the countries again, you know, that were the ex communists were in power, these things were they were reluctant to do that, right? So they didn't cut the subsidies. So they kept subsidizing unprofitable enterprise prizes, subsidizing you know groups of people, and that brings you electoral support. But it didn't change, it doesn't solve the problem, the systemic problem. But there's no political will to do that because you rely on the support of the rural masses and the less educated and the blue collar and the more backward regions. And that was the case of these, you know, Romania and Bulgaria. The, the ex communists relied exactly on those strata of the population and in exchange they gave them benefits. Okay, so massive, massive social cost, especially in the 90s, because as I said, uh, the. Uh, this sort of a transition has never been attempted by countries of Western Europe in such, or anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world at any point, from complete state ownership to, to a market economy. Uh, nobody has tried it. Nobody has tried it before these, uh, before these countries, and nobody has tried it in such you know, uh, an amount uh, of time, such a limited uh, uh, period of time. Okay, so these were just some some aspects that I wanted to, to point out and kind of focus your attention to and, and just also to direct you to, to think in terms of, uh, of the connection between, first of all, the major challenges, the major elements that are entailed in this economic transition, right, so the major elements of this economic transition, to the connection between the political, economic and why not social transition. Three, the fact that these happen differently for connected reasons, and again it's worth thinking forward, which is why I posted that assignment, to why do these transitions happen differently in these three regions that I will mention. There can be many reasons, right? Um, and, you know, finally, to, to again get a more detailed sense of, 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 of the staggering dimensions of what, uh, of what this meant, and to keep in mind the fact that other countries have attempted such a transition, for example, the countries of former uh, Soviet Union, like the Russian Federation, uh, and there it didn't work. So it's not a given. And the fact that it worked in Central Eastern Europe with all these problems, and even in the Balkans today, which all are democratic states with their own problems, but whatever, uh, that, is, that is a major thing, I and mean, it's, it's worth thinking about uh, why and how, and the fact that it is not.